Pastor for this session and for being a part of this conversation. Um, what, what this presentation is entitled is called Black Lives Matter, what it is and what it isn't or what it ain't. Um, and my name is Brandon Mack and you'll learn a little bit more about me over the course of this. And this is a two part session. We're gonna deal with the first part here. We're talking about Black Lives Matter and the movement. And then the next one will be a session about moving from allyship to accompliship. And we'll talk a little bit more about that over the course of the presentation. So to give you an overview, um, I plan on just uh, presenting for about 45 minutes because I want enough time for your questions and for us to have a discussion. If any questions come up throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them into the chat and we'll try to address them uh, towards the end of the presentation. I'm gonna start off with an acknowledgement and dedication talk a little bit about myself, a history lesson, intersectionality, Black Lives Matter, some issues that we're dealing with today, what is allyship and accompliship, our current movement, and then give you a little teaser on some of the things we'll talk about in the next section. So first off, wanna do an acknowledgement and dedication of four amazing people uh, it, that have definitely impacted my life over the last year. Um, one being Breonna Taylor, Unfortunately, we have not gotten accountability for what happened to Breonna Taylor. So we have to continue to uplift her name and the name of so many other people similar to her, such as Makia Bryant, who we lost yesterday. Um, definitely wanna honor George Floyd. We did receive, he did receive accountability for his murder yesterday in a historic movement, but I just want everyone to know that what we saw yesterday was accountability. It is not justice. It is a very different thing. Justice is something that can't be achieved for George Floyd because he is no longer here and with us. But I'm hoping that um, the case that we saw yesterday will lead to more accountability and hopefully justice, which will be a change in the system that is policing and criminal justice. Um, the young girl that you see down there to the left, uh, that is my newest niece. Uh, her name is Bethany Faith. Uh, she is now two months old. <laughs> and I dedicate this to her and to my nieces and nephews because my hope is, is that in us engaging in this work and engaging in this dialogue together, we're building a better world for her and all the young ones coming up. And then the fourth person, uh, is Monica Roberts. Monica was a dear friend, amazing fellow activist who we unfortunately lost this past October. She was a historian here in Houston, influential in the trans community and the world. And once again, we do this work in honor of all Black lives. So a little bit about me. So my name is Brandon Mack, pronouns he, him, his. I have been an activist for over 15 years. I work in a variety of different spaces. Um, I've been a part of Black Lives Matter Houston since our founding and inception back in 2013. I'm also on the board of the Houston GLBT Political Caucus, uh, the co-chapter director of New Leaders Council, which is the largest progressive training organization in the United States. I'm a doctoral student working on a PhD in higher education, leadership and policy studies. I'm an associate director of admission at Rice University, unapologetically, all of my interactions and all of my intersections. And the reason why I list all this is to let you know that when any of us come into this work and any of us come into this movement, we bring all of ourselves into this work. Nothing is ever done in isolation. So I want you to know all the different ways that I come into this space. Uh, but also I have to acknowledge my privileges. So I am cisgendered. So I will talk about things related to the trans experience, but I'm not a member of the trans experience, but I do have cisgender privilege. I also have educational privilege. As you heard, I've had multiple degrees and so I've had access to education. Um, I do also have, I'm able to body generally. Uh, so all those different privileges are things we also have to acknowledge with respect to the way that we engage in this work, but that's also understanding the positionality that I'm coming from, but it's always important that we uplift those voices that are marginalized and often not heard when we're talking about their experiences. So history lesson. The reason why we are here is because of history and we cannot ignore history because if we keep ignoring history, it is what? Destined to repeat itself. And let's face it, we have seen this happen time after time after time. 
So I have to remind people that Black people in the United States of America, we did not create this system. We did not have access and ability to create this system. We were brought over to this country forcibly, not of our own choice. When we got to this country, we were not even deemed human. When this constitution was written, we were not considered. We were considered to be property. And even then, we have had to work to get to personhood because we went from property to three fifths of a person. And that wasn't even for our own benefit, it was for the benefit of our enslavers to them being given personhood. But even in the midst of that, our rights have never been guaranteed and have never been fully conferred to us, which is why we still see what we see today with voter suppression but also most specifically with our relationship to policing. I make sure to put that um, in my presentation, the one away slave patrol to remind us all that the first police officers in this country were slave catchers. These individuals did not look at black people as being human. They looked at them as being property and being considered problematic and dangerous. So from the inception of us as a society, we have had a negative relationship between race and policing. And it goes all the way back to our history. So we have to be mindful of that of the reason for why we see calls for a dismantling and a reform and a change of this system is because of that history of how policing inherently views the black body and black people as being negative and not human. And so this has perpetuated itself even to this day today where we have a 15 year old black girl calling the cops, asking for protection only to be killed. So we have to remember this history and it requires intentional action in order to change this system and for us to not see this history continuously reappearing and acting itself. So as I said, we've been fighting for this, for our rights for so long, we go to the Civil Rights Act and we go to the Civil Rights Movement. During the Civil Rights Movement, you have African-Americans for the first time collectively calling for our rights, calling for our humanity and it being legislated. But the sad and painful fact is, is that we still have to do that fight because many of the advances that were achieved during the civil rights movement have unfortunately been gutted. So the Voting Rights Act, many of those provisions no longer exist. The Civil Rights Act, 1965, many of those things, unfortunately still have been gut, gut uh, 1964, many of those things have still been gutted. So we've been doing this work. And the reason why I acknowledge this is because the Black Lives Matter movement is still a continuation of the civil rights movement. We draw from many of the lessons of Bayard Rustin, who is the architect of the March on Washington. We draw on the history of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Ella Baker, Claudette Coven, so many amazing people who gave their lives to once again assert that black people and our, and our humanity needs to be treated equally in this country if we're going to believe in those values of freedom and justice for everybody. So we are once again on their shoulders, but we have learned from what they've done, but we're now doing it in a very different way to accommodate the technology that we have today, but also just to learn from what happened back then. And back then you saw many different organizations that operated under a traditional structure, 
you're not going to see the same thing when it comes to Black Lives Matter. And that's once again, learning from that past. I showed this because once again, we have to draw, we also draw strength from the LGBTQ plus movement because inherently Black Lives Matter has always been an LGBTQ plus movement from our inception. So we draw from Stonewall and I always have to remind people that Stonewall started because of a riot. It started from LGBTQ plus people once again saying that they were no longer going to be dehumanized. And once again, it was a, with respect to an interaction with police. So the photos you see here are of Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, two amazing trans women who literally threw the shoe that started this movement. And we draw strength from them. And once again, it's about once it's once again about making sure that the most marginalized of us are taken care of as well. So we don't leave anyone behind in this movement. So that brings us to where we're at. So to the right. The three Black women that you see there are the founders of Black Lives Matter. So Black Lives Matter started in 2012. It started in large part due to um, what happened to Trayvon Martin and the injustices that were done with respect to his case. Um, the person who murdered Trayvon Martin did not receive any accountability um, for what he did. And as a result, these three women developed the hashtag Black Lives Matter as a way of bringing attention to the injustice that was done to Trayvon Martin, but also to assert that our lives matter. And from there came Black Lives Matter as an organization and this movement. It rose to even greater prominence in 2013 uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, as a result of the murder of Michael Brown. And you saw people from all over the United States descend to Ferguson to once again assert that we as Black people will no longer be dehumanized by the state, by police, and by this country. And that we once again have to assert that our lives matter and that intentional actions are needed in order to change the way our lives are being handled in this country. So it started with police brutality, but it definitely connects to so many other issues because what the central problem is, is that in the United States of America, we have a fundamental devaluation of black life problem. And it goes all the way back to the start of this history lesson and has manifested itself in the ways that police treat us, in the way that courts treat us, in the way that we are not being treated equally. And that's why you see so many disparities in so many other issues related to healthcare, related to education, related to so many other areas. And Black Lives Matter is a response to that devaluation. We are boldly and unapologetically asserting that our lives matter. So intersectionality is very, very important in this work. The reason why intersectionality is important is because none of us are solely just one thing. We are a mix of various different identities. Um, if someone could um, mute themselves, for thank you. Um, so to give you a sense of intersectionality, it was a, a term that was coined by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, an amazing legal mind and professor who came up with this theory to talk about the ways in which intersecting identities impact black women and the legal system. It has been expanded to once again talk about the ways in which our intersecting identities in, interact with various different institutions and various different uh, ways that in which we operate within this world. So Black Lives Matter as an organization, Black Lives Matter as a movement is very intersectional because we inherently live intersectional lives. 
me as a person, as I mentioned, I am black, I am same gender loving gay, I have, I'm a three time cancer survivor. I bring all the different elements of myself into the way that I intersect with the world. And therefore I have to respect and honor my intersections just as if I would want to respect and honor the other intersections and lived experiences of other people. Because we have to realize that all of our oppressions, while they are unique, they are also linked and connected. So as a movement principle for us at Black Lives Matter Houston and as part of the Black Lives Matter movement, we're very intersectional in our approach. We focus on issues as they impact Black, Black people, but we also stand in solidarity and in community with other communities that are facing similar issues. So that's why when we saw Asian hate increasing here in the United States after the events of Atlanta, we stood in solidarity with the Chinese and Asian community and various Asian communities to say, we stand in solidarity with you because we understand the same feelings of being oppressed and of being targeted because of our race. When we saw the events uh, happening in the Jewish communities, we all wait, we stand in solidarity with our Jewish uh, family because once again, we understand the persecution based off of our race is similar and linked to the oppression that they feel that they experience due to their religion. So once again, none of this is ever done in isolation. And that's why we have to see our connections to each other. Because when we see the connections to each other, when we uh, respect the intersectionality of each other, we see each other's humanity. And when we see each other's humanity, it makes it easier for us to relate, but also not to devalue each other. So this is our way. Intersectionality is a way of being able to challenge that fundamental problem of the devaluation of Black life. So Black Lives Matter, what it is and what it isn't. Let's get to the crux of that. So as I always explain to people, when you think about Black Lives Matter, for me, it is four fundamental things. First and foremost, it started out as a hashtag, a way of bringing attention, using social media to the simple fact that Black Lives Matter. It brought great attention to the issues related to Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and too, too many others. So it's once again acknowledging that we can use technology and use the resources that we have to bring attention to these issues. Secondly, Black Lives Matter is a simple declarative statement. Black Lives Matter, period. There's no and, there's no but, there's nothing else that needs to come behind that. It is a simple declarative statement. And the reason why we have to make that declarative statement is because of once again, the history of black people and how they have been treated by the United States of America. It is our way of declaring that our lives fundamentally matter. And in declaring that, we are not minimizing anyone else's humanity. We are declaring our humanity in a place and space that hasn't always done so. So when you hear someone say that phrase, Black Lives Matter, period, that's where it ends. There should never be an and, a but, or anything of that nature. It is simply a declarative statement. Thirdly, Black Lives Matter is an organization. And it is an organization that fundamentally does not operate in a similar way that you will see other organizations operate. There are multiple Black Lives Matter chapters all across this country. There is a central Black Lives Matter organization, but even within a particular municipality, you can see multiple Black Lives Matter organizations. And the reason that is, is because of the fact that we all organize and operate differently because we are all approaching this huge problem of the devaluation of black life in a variety of different ways. But we are all empowered 
to address these issues in our local communities in the ways in which we best see fit. So here in the Houston area, you will see Black Lives Matter Houston, BLM HOU for our organization. There's also a Black Lives Matter Pearland. There's a Black Lives Matter Woodlands. There's a Black Lives Matter Galveston County. And the reason why there are these multiple chapters is because we all operate independently to address the issues within our particular communities, but we also work together collectively to address similar issues. But that's the reason for why it operates very differently. We don't have to, um, many of us are not connected to the national organization. And once again, that's on purpose. And the reason being is because we have different organizing principles. We don't have to wait for the national organization to say, oh, you can say this, oh, you can say that we operate autonomously because we are addressing what needs to be done here in Houston, Texas. And then fourth and, then fourth and finally, Black Lives Matter is a movement. This is not about just one issue. This is continuous. This is a movement, not a moment. So many people as a result of yesterday in the accountability that happened in the Derek Chauvin trial, think that, oh, Black Lives Matter is over. It is not. Because like I said, literally hours after that decision, we had another person die at the hands of police. Literally every single day during the Chauvin trial, a Black person was killed by police every single day in a variety of different municipalities all across this country. So while we are acknowledging this moment that has just happened, this is a movement because we are still being devalued and killed by the police. But in addition, Black people still are disproportionately dealing with health insecurities. The fact that this vaccine or vaccines are not universally available and are also disproportionately unavailable to Black people is a Black Lives Matter issue. Food insecurity, homelessness is also disproportionately impacting Black and people of color um, communities. That's a Black Lives Matter issue. Education, we know education funding is not equal. And we know that communities, especially Black communities, do not get the same resources educationally. And then that, of course, has its own impact in terms of economics and those opportunities. So this system keeps reinforcing itself in a variety of different ways that all leads to a devaluation of Black people. All of those are Black Lives Matter issues. And we are attacking every single one of those issues. So once again, this is not just a moment. This is a movement. So once again, I wanted to point this out in terms of the structure of Black Lives Matter Houston, uh, of Black Lives Matter and why it is very different. Um, it is a little small, but I'll be able to provide this to you so you'll be able to see it. So just so people understand is that once again, you have organizational supporters and individual supporters who act as donors, and then they give into the black into into Black Lives Matter. So you have the Black Lives Matter uh, Global Network Foundation, which is you know kind of the main central organization. They do partner with the Movement for Black Lives, which Black Lives Matter Houston is a part of. They are two separate entities. And the Movement for Black Lives is a collection of about 40 organizations uh, that collectively work together. And we have developed a platform and issue papers and things of that nature related to um, ways in which we want to see changes for the Black community. But that is independent of the Black Lives Matter uh, global organization. There are 17 chapters that are officially affiliated with the global network. But then there are many chapters like Black Lives Matter Houston where we are not affiliated. And once again, it is intentional because we operate and organize very differently. But all of them are part of the Black Lives Matter movement. The reason why we show this is because we know there's a lot of news out there in terms of how much money has been raised and things of that nature. When people donate, we always tell them, make sure that you know that you're donating either directly to the local chapter or are you donating to the larger global network? 
because if you are donating to the larger global network, your local chapter is likely not going to get any funds related to that. So it's always best if you want to uh, if you want to fund and support local efforts that you support the local chapter within your area. So, but once again, this is actually intentional because the traditional organizational structures were once again not built with black people in mind. We don't want to reinforce those um, structures. We want to dismantle and do something different. So that's why we operate and organize very differently. So I show you this cartoon because many people want to, want to know why you should never, ever use the phrase, all lives matter. This is why. So in this cartoon, you see a Black person holding up a sign saying Black Lives Matter. Then you see a white male coming in and he holds a sign that says all lives matter and says to her, no, all lives matter. You hear me, all lives. You see a woman coming in and she says, oh, thank God, I'm fleeing a war zone and no Muslims allowed. Or can't you read? I show you this is because when the phrase all lives matter came to prominence, it came to prominence not out of an assertion that we are all equal. It is used to delegitimize the Black Lives Matter movement, to delegitimize Black lives, and to once again devalue us as a people. Because at the center of the phrase, all lives matter, is once again trying to center those who are always centered in this country. I, for one, actually hate the phrase, founding fathers. Because who did they find this country for? Who was at the center of who, of who they were thinking about when they founded this country? It wasn't you. It wasn't me. They were founding it for property owning white men. So whenever someone uses that phrase, all lives matter, they're generally trying to recenter those who are always being centered. And I always tell people, if you find that someone has a problem with the phrase Black Lives Matter, ask them why they have a problem with it. Why do you have a problem with individuals who have always been devalued in this country and not treated equal asserting their humanity? Because me saying that my life matters does not impact your ability to matter. It doesn't. So that is for people who have a problem with the phrase to really think about why do you have a problem? Why do you have a problem with other people being centered in that moment? Other people's voices being elevated, other people's voices being heard. Because my humanity does not impact your ability to be a human and to live. It doesn't. And once again, that's why we have to think about things in an intersectional way, that we should all equally matter. We should all have the ability to be and breathe. Be and breathe. Because that's what I want for my life. I want the opportunity to fully be all of myself and not feel that because I am black, because I'm a same gender loving individual that inherently I don't get access to just be myself and live. And that, that my existence is somehow a justification of my devaluation. So please never ever use the phrase, all lives matter and challenge those individuals that you hear who use this phrase. Because once again, the basis of this statement is not about equality. It's about trying to contribute to the, the devaluation of individuals who are asserting their value in this country. 
Now, you will hear the phrase, all Black Lives Matter. Now, this is a phrase you definitely can use and should use. The reason why is because even within our community, as a Black community, we even have a devaluation that goes on. And oftentimes it is directed to those of us who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. I have been in spaces where fellow black activists have said, oh, we do not need to concern ourselves about that issue because they're devaluating individuals of the trans experience. We don't abide by that. Because in this country, the average life expectancy of a black trans person is 35. 35. Our trans family is being murdered and killed at a disproportionate rate. So their lives inherently matter and we are deeply committed to that. So as part of that, we assert that all Black Lives Matter to once again be reflective of the intersectionality and the inclusiveness of this movement. Because when I go out into the world, the world sees me first as a Black person because this skin don't come off. This wonderful chocolateness does not come off. It is what the world sees first and foremost. So before anyone even knows that I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community, they see me as Black. They treat me and have all the things that come with that. And I go through that same experience, similar to anyone who could be perceived as being a heterosexual or cisgendered person. So therefore, we have to once again, make it very, very clear that as an organization, as a um, movement, we are intersectional, we uphold all lives, and we are fighting for all Black lives. So... Definitely. When you see the phrase, all Black lives matter, that's the reason why you hear that it is different than when you hear all lives matter. We are asserting, once again, when we talk about Black lives matter, we are talking about every single person who self-identifies and is a part of the Black diaspora. So some issues of today that we are dealing with. January 6th. January 6th. Um... How many of you, just by, you know, uh, if you can use the reaction button for me, how many of you were surprised by what you saw? A thumbs up if you were surprised by January 6th. All right. Thank you for some of y'all. Thank you for your honesty. Honestly, I'm going to be very, very honest. January 6th, I was not surprised. I was not surprised. The reason for why I, sorry, the reason why I wasn't surprised by January 6th was because what we saw on January 6th was hundreds of years of white privilege and white supremacy going unchecked. That is what we saw. Um, the former occupant of the White House, I like to refer to him as the Orange Menace. He used his platform to continuously devalue so many different communities, so many different people. And when he did that, he also emboldened people to contribute to that. And because of the fact that he went unchecked, the individuals who participated in January 6th also were thinking they were not going to go checked. And once again, look at how we have operated as a society and as a world, is that you will see white individuals yell, scream, cuss, act any kind of way to law enforcement and they end up alive at the end of that interaction. Black people don't even have to say anything and we still end up dead. So what I'm showing in these two images here is literally side by side, 
the reaction from law enforcement when it came to a Black Lives Matter protest on the left and what you saw on January 6th. When we protest, when we even say that we're gonna do a march, when we show up anywhere, we unfortunately are always met with a heavy police presence. Yesterday, when we did a, a vigil in honor of George Floyd in McGregor Park, there were two helicopters overhead. There were police at the park waiting for something to happen. Downtown was literally boarded up. All of that just because Black people were intending to gather, to be in community, over some accountability. January 6th, no barricades, no tier, you know, no barricades, no police presence. In fact, there is video of police actually letting people in, ushering people down stairs. And to date, have we seen anyone being held accountable for what happened on January 6th? So what we saw on that TV screen, once again, is how white supremacy and white privilege goes unchecked. And what we are continuing to see is how that privilege and that um, is still going unchecked because we're not seeing any accountability. So we as a community, we as a society, need to start checking white privilege and white supremacy. Because once again, there's a devaluation problem here and we can't automatically assume that black people are inherently dangerous. So if you don't want Jan January 6th to ever happen again, you need to start checking your people. Because racism, once again, is a system that black people did not create. We did not have the ability to make laws, to institute this system. This is a problem that white people created and therefore you have got to be a part of the solution of dismantling it. And part of that is checking what we saw on January 6th. Another issue that we have seen today, Meghan Markle, so the reason why I bring this up is because what we saw in Meghan Markle is an issue that we have got to counterbalance and that is the distrust that comes from when black people talk about our own experiences. So Meghan Markle and Princess Diana both did the same thing. They took to, they took to a national TV, gave an interview talking about their experiences with the royal family. Princess Diana was believed, Meghan Markle, was questioned. And Piers Morgan and Sharon Osbourne took to using their national platforms to further question her experiences and also demonstrate the racism of the situation. I hope many of y'all saw Sharon Osbourne and how she acted. Don't ever act like that ever again. What she did demonstrated that she wasn't willing to understand the problem. The fact that she told Cheryl Underwood that she couldn't cry is definitely racist because we're not expected to have emotion. We're expected to deal with all of your emotion, but we can't have a reaction because then we get labeled as the angry black person or not acting right and things of that nature. But once again, that's a system we did not create. And then you also cannot demand education. We are not your diversity cookie. We are not your diversity textbook. We can engage in a conversation if we are willing to get engaged in that conversation. And that's why I'm here to volunteer as tribute, so to speak. But once again, you should never demand education from any person of color. That is not our job. We can have a conversation and we'll learn about how to have those conversations in the next session, but you should never demand that we have to share our experiences and be your education tool. But 
you got to accept our lived experience and not question it. So what I hope we learn from the Meghan Markle situation as a society is that we have got to trust Black people and especially trust Black women. Because that distrust, once again, contributes to our devaluation. It's the reason for why we have a horrendous Black women maternal mortality rate. It's why when we cry out for pain in healthcare, we're not believed. Do you know that it's actually supposedly believed that, that medically believed that we have a higher pain threshold, even though it has been debunked so many times, but there are doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals who operate in that way. So when we cry out for pain, it doesn't get the same response. That is devaluation. So please don't contribute to it. So uh, in the interest of time, because we are getting close to the time, what you're going to see for the remainder of this presentation is a preview and hopefully why we will continue this conversation in the second session. In the next section, I will talk about what allyship and accompliceship is and how we move from one to the other. So allies is a very, very passive interaction, right? It is just simply, you show up to the protest, you take the selfie, that's it. Accompliceship is what we need now. It is doing the intentional work of helping to dismantle this system. As I often like to say, this is when, let's say we lost, the ally is like, oh, I'm sorry, you lost. They go about their business. The accomplice is right there with you with the broom being like, hey, I am here with you. We're gonna clean up this situation. We're gonna partner together and we're gonna figure out how do we win? What is needed now is accomplices, not allies. So I hope that you will join me in the next session to learn more about what exactly is accompliceship and how we move to that. So we will definitely talk about defund the police and how to have conversations about that because once again, this is about having systemic conversations and talking about systems rather than only talking about one single issue. Defund is the right word. The reason why it's the right word is because it's talking about using intentional legislative controls to eliminate financial support. But this is a conversation that we need to have and we'll talk about how to have that conversation and also what the difference is between defunding and abolishing. But once again, as far as what Black Lives Matter is and isn't, this is a movement we are focused on and working on so many different issues, educational inequalities, economic injustices, food insecurity, homelessness, racism, even within this movement, all these things contribute to addressing that fundamental problem of the devaluation of human life. And we need to get to a place where we are better valuing each other and valuing Black people. But it's going to be from a multi-pronged approach, and we approach it that way. Protests, rallies, marches, lobbying efforts, policy changes, having these tough conversations. We are all a part of this movement, and we all have a part to play. And we'll definitely talk about in the next session some of the things you can do, but a little teaser. I encourage you to listen. I encourage you to have those conversations, especially as a non-Black person, having them with fellow non-Black people. Definitely to advocate and raise your voice. Do not wait for a charismatic leader. You are the leader. You are the ones that we are being waiting for. And I'm hoping that this is empowering you to be a part of this movement. But always and always make sure that you're taking care of yourself. So my information, if you ever want to follow me, I always, like I say, say volunteer my own self. So I've also included my personal email, which is brandon.d.mac at gmail.com. So if you ever have any questions and you want someone to wrestle with and practice these conversations with, you can always feel free to hit me up. So with that, I'm going to stop my, uh, my screen because I want to see all you wonderful people and let's engage in some conversation. I have a question for you, Brandon. Yes, ma'am. I, I know what kinds of things were taken out of the Voting Rights Act, but yes, I'm not familiar with what, what was lost out of the Civil Rights Act. What have we lost out of that in the past 50 years? Sure. So some of the things that we have 
unfortunately lost in the Civil Rights Act over the past 50 years is that while it is listed that you can't discriminate, there are still places and spaces in the United States that are still discriminating on the basis of race. There are actually even still school districts that participate in segregated schooling even though the Civil Rights Act and Brown versus Board of Education, I know it's so bad to the point my glasses had to fall off, <laughs> that <laughs> this is still happening. So even though we have the Civil Rights Act, which is basically saying you can't discriminate on the basis of this, it's mm -hmm. still going on. And mm -hmm. part of the reason for why we've lost that is because the enforcement of it has been gutted. So like, for example, with the Voting Rights Act, you're probably aware of the fact that you used to have to do pre-clearance, where basically, if you had any changes, you got to let it be known. Mm -hmm. Well, in a similar consequence, when it comes to the Civil Rights Act, if you're going to do racist legislation and things of that nature, there's no pre-clearance anymore, right? Or any way for the Justice Department to do a lot of what it can do to reform the Voting Rights Act. So my hope is, especially with the fact that we have a new administration and a change in the Justice Department, we'll see more, more reinforcement of the, of the Civil Rights Act of 64. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, seem, it seems to me in the case of, of segregated schooling that it's, it's done in a very subtle way. Yeah. And, and so I wonder about how we can get that enforced. Um, it seems like in, in Austin, at least, it's it's probably going to have to be through serious changes to our zoning laws. Exactly. That may be true elsewhere, too. Exactly, because there's a lot of these subtle things, like you said, with zoning. I mean, the biggest thing right now, in the, uh, if y'all are following the Texas Ledge, it's depressing. It Let's is. be very <laughs> honest. It's very depressing. Um, what they're doing, especially for voting rights right now, you're trying to put Jim Crow right back into Texas politics is exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. What they're doing, and, and like you said, it's gonna take a lot of that intentional work by the legislator and by actions in order to dismantle what's going on. Now, currently, I'm not too confident, unfortunately, but yeah. that's also the reason for why we gotta pay attention and we all gotta participate because this is a systemic problem that reinforces itself, right? So it's like you got to intercede where you can intercede. So that's why voting is so important, because that's one place where we can intercede. We got to raise our voices when these legislative sessions happen and be as part of it as we can. Hey, I understand you got to work. But please, if you got an ability to send an email, a phone call, anything to your legislators to say, I'm not for this at any point, even leaving a message, it is worth it because they have to tally every single one of that. Mm -hmm. Hey, Brandon. Hello, Melody. Hey, great presentation, by the way. I appreciate you, you taking the time. It really meant a lot. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and I'm probably not going to say it in the right way. OK, one thing to know about me, don't worry about it. Yeah, Please, no, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to get at the heart of the matter. But like where I live, you got these reds and you got these blues mm -hmm. and in the some people are like, oh, BLM, you know, oh, that's a that's instigated by the blue and I'm a red. And how can we extract that out of a us versus them and make it more of a human rights or a civil sure. rights to where, whether, I mean, I know voting and policy, that's where it's gotta happen and I'm all mm -hmm. for that. But at the end of the day, how can I talk to red people and make them realize that BLM is a human rights thing and not just some political thing or, and, and as an augmented question, mm -hmm. This is a different track, but so many rallies and protests end up with, you know, violence and bad, uh, cr you know, kind of criminal criminal behavior, and that mm -hmm. kind of casts a pall over the whole, you know, the whole thing it stands for. And what do we say about that? How can we? Sure. I don't know. Get get out of that. Thank you. Sure. So, Ms. Melody, first off, the first question. I always tell people, black people are not a monolith. We are not. We are all across the political spectrum. So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, this is not about politics. This is about inherently, I am asserting that my life matters. So that's the reason for why when we do rallies, marches, and things of that nature, notice it is open as to who can come and participate. It is not that we you know, are saying we are affiliated with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, Libertarian Party, anybody's party. Uh-uh. I'm about what are we doing 
to deal with the fundamental problem. So that's the reason for why when you when people have these conversations, it is about that we have this conversation and take it away from the politics. And it's about black people, fundamentally. So you can be, I, I have Republican friends who chat Black Lives Matter and are having those conversations. I have blue friends who don't have these conversations and need to have these conversations. So hence, I don't care about political affiliation. That's not my issue. My issue is that fundamentally, we have always had a problem with not valuing Black people. So go back to that always, that what this is and what this movement is about is about valuation. So that's why I frame it in that way, because I think it helps to take the politics out of it and be like, what this is about is how do we value each other? Now to your second part. I always have to remind people, people unfortunately take advantage of situations and they're not necessarily affiliated with what's going on. So many times, even when you see the violence and things of that nature that happens, and it gets affiliated with Black Lives Matter, is the people actually involved affiliated with Black Lives Matter? Many of them are not, but you see what you see. Now, also, you have to remember, we're dealing with hundreds upon hundreds of years of pain. Pain. So I also have to remind people of that to put it into context of when you see people engaging in this way, it is because they're also getting out their pain. So it's not necessarily that they're acting violently, especially they're not acting violently against people. Property, why are we always valuing property over people? We've been doing that for hundreds of years. So hence, sometimes the people are doing that is them taking out pain rather than engaging in violence. But also be clear as to who's affiliated with who, because often you will see non-Black people engaging in violence, but then they don't get labeled as violent. Me, I go out and yell Black Lives Matter, and then all of a sudden I'm considered to be a domestic terrorist. Let's deal with that problem. But yeah, that's, that. hopefully that helps a little bit, Miss Melody. <laughs> Brandon, I have a question. Go for it, Chaz. Hi, thank you so much for sharing um, your, your expertise and your knowledge on, on these topics. They're, they're really timely and very important. Thank you. Uh, I, was, I wanna talk a little bit about reparations. Yes. Uh, what do you think about that in terms of, you know, how does it cooperate or not cooperate? Um, how the interplay with Black Lives Matter? Uh, we see Evanston, Illinois, mm -hmm. which has the first city in America to offer reparations to its mm -hmm. Black residents. Um, and we've also seen uh, very recently some Congress or some bills that are advancing through Congress. Mm -hmm. to, uh, not necessarily implement reparations yet, but they want to begin studying it. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts about, about reparations in the 21st mm -hmm. century United States of America. That I do. <laughs> so let me talk about reparations. First and foremost, I am pro reparations. The reason why I am pro reparations is because once again, history. We have got to deal with the fact that black people built this country off of labor and were never paid. So the United States has a bill that is very overdue. Reparations is a way of collecting on that bill. Two, I think people, when they think of reparations, they need to think of it in multiple ways rather than what I think most people think of it as, as just giving a check. That's not my approach to reparations personally. My approach to reparations is what are the systems that have been created at the detriment of Black people and how can we address that? Because for example, Black people disproportionately economic injustice, part of that is because we haven't been able to generate wealth. Why haven't we been able to generate wealth? Our family couldn't have access to said wealth, but and yet you benefited from it and you're not wanting to give back what you didn't work for. How many of y'all hate that phrase, pull yourself up by the bootstraps? I hate it. I'm like this. How can you say that when I didn't even have shoestrings? I didn't even have shoestrings. What can I pull myself up from? So part of me is this is about leveling that playing field. For me, if I were to implement reparations, one, I would eliminate student loan debt. 
because I think that, that is a form of reparations. We have not had access to education. You tell us to get access to education, the way you tell us to pay for it is getting loans. Wait a minute, I didn't have access to be able to pay for it from the beginning, you owe me that. Two, I think if we eliminated prisons and eliminated and erased criminal records, that could be a form of reparations because once again, black people are disproportionately criminalized even for same things that white individuals do and the system has perpetuated it. If you eliminate criminal records that then gives people access to jobs, access to economic opportunity, housing and all those other things created by lack. Uh, addressing homelessness could also be another way of being able to perform reparations because once again, we didn't have access to housing in the same ways. So I am pro reparations. I am pro for us thinking about it because once again, how is my betterment at your disadvantage, especially since you benefited from my ancestors working for you all those years and we're not going to talk about that. So hence, Yes, pro reparations. I think it's been pers personally, I think it's been studied quite a bit. <laughs> so I'm not for the study. I'm like, let's talk about how do we do this? Because honestly, if we implement a lot of these things, it leads to a better society for everybody. So yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So two minutes, I know I'm running out of time. But once again, please feel free to communicate with me outside of this. If you ever have any questions, I always am happy to talk. <laughs> As you can kind of tell. <laughs> Brandon, I have a question. Go for it. So you said racism is a system that black people didn't put in place and white people did. And so they have to dismantle that system. Mm -hmm. But the problem is um, this, the Episcopal Church has a program called Sacred Ground. Yes, ma'am. In, in Sacred Ground, you learn a lot of the history that you didn't learn in school. And mm -hmm. I, I thought I was pretty progressive but there was there was a lot i didn't know yes ma'am and so if people don't know the history when when anyone starts talking about reparations or starts talking about uh, uh people who were able to earn a living and do it very well getting their businesses burned to the ground mm -hmm. you talk about when you talk about other groups yeah, about tulsa <laughs> yeah when you talk about other groups of people who were treated poorly and and had some of the same things happen, although they weren't brought here in slave boats, mm -hmm. I don't know. You said don't look for charismatic leaders. You're the leader, but mm -hmm. I don't know necessarily. I start out with small groups, but mm -hmm. I don't know necessarily how to how to get white people to hear what they weren't taught in school, what they don't want to admit to, and phrases that make their skin crawl. Mm -hmm. So, so tell me, tell me how to dismantle that system mm -hmm. without getting that help from other white people. Sure. Especially so. older people like me that, you, you know, we've worked all our lives we want to retire we don't want to do anything else don't talk to me about making all these changes <laughs> yes ma'am completely could understand that and we will talk a lot more about this in the next session so hopefully you'll be able to do that but let me leave you with this look at this wonderful screen you got a lot of support right and you got a lot of different people so that's the reason for why it's important to take the lessons and the things of that nature that you've learned and then have these conversations with other people who you're gonna have access to that I won't. So it is about having those smaller conversations. It is about, hey, maybe you are at the family table and you talk about ta Coates right there. So therefore you're having the conversation. You talk about the fact of, hey, did you know that back in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was a thriving Black community that was set upon by people and completely wiped out? Oh, you didn't know about that. Well, then let me tell you about that. So it's about being in those spaces because you're already in those spaces to then have those conversations that will then change people's minds to then go out and look for other things. Because the key thing here is like, like I said, this is about you helping to dismantle a system that I did not have any help in creating. Part of that is 
you also exposing other people to what they don't know, exposing them to having these conversations and to learn what you don't know. And oftentimes it's going to happen because they know you, that they will do it. They don't know me. To me, I'm just a random Black person, but they know you, Ms. Rios. So if they value and they care about you, which generally they do, they're more likely going to be invested to learn more about what you're talking about. That's the hope. Hope that helped. Thank you. All right, folks, it is 8.02. I just want to respect everybody's time. <laughs> but once again, always happy to have these conversations. Really, thank you, Ms. Trevino, for uh, creating this space. I look forward to seeing y'all next week to talk about a little bit more of this. It'll be more try to get y'all interactive and thinking about how we do this. And I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Brandon, on behalf of the whole group for the Diocese of Texas. And um, just to note that after the second session next week, there will be a little time at the end. We'll talk about a lot of resources that are available in the diocese that are free to all of you. So that are really going to help you address some of the questions that have come up tonight. So we'll talk about that at the end. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Thank you so all much. so much. I'll take care and have a good evening. All right.